Go to the book of Philippians. You, thank y'all so much. They're going to go over and get ready for the banquet. And so uh, we wish them well. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 through 18. As you're turning there, I was thinking back to a Gideon story uh, in my life. And I think it, it fits in what we're going to talk about this morning uh, is we talk about shining like lights in our world. And Justice, I appreciate uh, songs that tie directly in with the message and how the Holy Spirit just does that. But uh, I was in Lima, Peru some years ago on a mission trip, and uh, we were getting ready to fly out, and so uh, we were headed to the airport, and our taxi driver, uh, he had a Gideon New Testament on his console. And so the interpreter was in the car with us, and so I asked him, about that Gideon New Testament, and he said he really didn't understand it. So we began to talk, and, and uh, we shared the plan of salvation with him, and right there outside of Chili's, the same Chili's that we have in Marshall, the Chili's, uh, we led him to the Lord. And it was just a glorious day to be able to explain to him that Jesus Christ died for his sins, and he could have forgiveness of those sins, and he could have salvation. And I thought, you know, it was that Gideon New Testament. He didn't know what was in it. He didn't understand it fully. But that just that little Gideon New Testament was a conversation starter that day. Uh, there were Gideons down in Lima, Peru, that were there shining like lights in the world. And because of that, that man came to know Christ that day. And so we're going to talk about what it is to be a light in the world and uh, what that means to us. Last week we talked about working out our salvation with fear and trembling and what that meant. And so I think this continues on in the same thing. Paul is saying, how do we do that? He's, he's given us wisdom and instruction on how to be lights in the world. Uh, the IVP background commentary says that Jewish tradition often compared the righteous to lights in the world. One of the scriptures that backs that up is over in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, where the Lord says those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount very explicitly told us that we are to be the light of the world. He is the light of the world, and He's going to shine through us, and we're not to hide that light. We're to shine that light to the glory of God the Father, and so that men may glorify our Father. So all through Scripture, we see that we are to be lights. This is a word picture that is, that is used. And he says, in the midst of a crooked and twisted, perverse generation, in verse 15, as we look at it this morning, that's, that's the context that we find ourselves in. You know, I talked about the Equality Act just a moment ago. Uh, I want to be careful when I speak to issues like that, that I also tell you that those who are in the LGBTQ community, um, we are to love folks, you know, with the love of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that we're for a lot of the things, a lot of the legislation that's coming along that would then, you know, come against us and the values, the biblical values that we stand for. So we wouldn't be very firm to stand on biblical values. We're going to preach truth from this pulpit. But at the same time, we're to shine like lights, and we are to love folks in our world, folks that don't agree with us, lost folks. We're to love them. And this is what we're being taught here. So Paul gives this wisdom to a church or churches in Philippi living in the midst of a generation like that. And I think, man, how applicable is that to us, uh, that we are in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation as well? So he gives us this wisdom that just like them, we're to shine as lights also. And, and I'm so thankful for y'all because I believe that you do this, uh, but we can always use more work in this area. So let's see what the Lord has to teach us this morning. Philippians chapter 2 and we're going to look at verses 14 through 17. Remember, put it in the context. This is part of us working out our salvation with fear and trembling. You stand with me as we honor God in the reading of His Word. Do all things, it says, without grumbling or disputing. Some versions say complaining. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am be, to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, as you teach us to be lights in our context, in our culture. Lord, I pray that we would do that, that we would shine your light. You're the only hope this world has. You are the light of the world. And Lord, we have this message, this gospel message, that the only way to be saved, the only way to eternal life, the only way to relationship with God the Father is through you, Jesus. And so I pray that that gospel would be on our lips, that good news would always be pouring forth from our hearts, that we would truly shine like lights. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you, Jesus. It is in your name we pray it all. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, I, I was thinking also, and I shared this with the early service this morning, that I, I just want to commend you as your pastor. Um, when I see things, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago when we had the ice storm, uh, I had one of our members call, and uh, it was that morning when I-20 was just locked down. Nathan cut a guy's hair this week. He said, I was in the middle of all that mess. And he said, I was, I was on I-20 stuck for 22 hours. And I got a call that morning from uh, one of our folks. Actually, it was around lunchtime. And he said, hey, is there anything we can do for people that are stuck out there? Because there are people that need food, they need water, um, you know, all, all of those things. And he says, is there anything we can do? I said, let me make some calls. Uh, because, you know, we have a United Help of Wascom and they have the food pantry and all that. So I called Rose and, and she said, people have already been doing it. And, and that is awesome. And I just, my heart just rejoiced. And, and she said, another group is going to meet down there like at 1.30. And so there were, there were folks that are here this morning. I'm not going to embarrass them, but they were making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and hot dogs and, and, and water and all of that and taking care packages out to people and walking up and down between those cars, handing out those care packages. And about that time, the traffic released and, and folks went on around 1.30 or so, something like that. But I thought, how precious and how wonderful is that? Uh, that we have people doing that. Now, that's what it is on a practical level to shine like a light in this world. And I just want to say, well done. I commend you. Uh, good stuff. And, and, and this is what it is, a living illustration right there. So as he gives us this wisdom, I want to share with you three things this morning that he says will help you to walk like a light in the world. And the first one is found right there in verse 14, and it is so practical and, and yet it's, it's something that I preach to myself first because I find this takes root in my heart. He says, do all things without grumbling or complaining. So how do we work out our salvation with fear and trembling and shine like a light that he's designed us to be? Well, the first way is this. He said, you need to avoid the complaining, the grumbling, and the disputing. Now, that begins down in the heart, and this, at least that's where I find it in myself, uh, is it starts down inside of me somewhere, and eventually it comes out through my words but we examine from Scripture that we all, as humanity, we have a problem in this area. We think back to our daily Bible readings that we're going through right now as we're, as we're reading through the Bible this year, and you think about all the times that the children of Israel, they grumbled, they complained, they disputed. Uh, one place is over in Exodus 15, 24, they didn't have water, and so the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? I mean, they grumbled all the time. I, I'm just flabbergasted as I read back through the Scripture and I see when I'm in Exodus and when I'm in Numbers just the number of times they complained and just the number of times that God came to their rescue, God did something for them, God miraculously moved, and yet they still doubted. And I think oftentimes we're the same way. We see God's hand move. We see Him take care of us on a daily basis. We can go back and we can see miracles in our own lives, and yet oftentimes because we like to fix things, right? Right? Because we like to be in control of things. It's just human nature. When something arises, when there's a problem, when there's an issue, we grumble and we complain. I think back to Israel, and I, th I think just over and over again, they would grumble. They would grumble about not having water. God would give them water. They would get to the next place and didn't have any water. So they would grumble again about the lack of water over and over. They grumbled about not having food. God gave them manna. And they grumbled that they wanted more than just manna. God gave them meat. And then they grumbled and said, it's a stench in our nostrils. We've got so much meat. Over and over, they would grumble. They would grumble because they were afraid. God would deliver them. They'd come to the next crisis. And they would complain some more. I mean, it was just over and over this cycle. They would grumble against the leadership. We're sanctified like you, Moses. We're set apart like you, Aaron. Why can't we be in leadership? Over and over and over. This is the human condition. And yet Paul says, we got to fight against this in the spirit. If you're going to shine like lights in the world, you need to be people that don't grumble, 
They don't complain. So look how Scripture corrects us in this. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 9, the Apostle Peter says this word and, and wades into this discussion. He says, show hospitality to one another without the grumbling. And that's what we're to do. Because in our context in church, so, so often we will see something we don't like, something won't go like we like it, and what do we do? You feel it rising up in you. You'll begin to talk. You'll begin to get somebody's ear. You'll begin to speak a word to them. And it's a word of concern, right? I need to share a prayer request with you. You know, we have all kinds of ways of couching it in nice terms, but really a lot of it boils down to let's gossip a little bit. I need a listening ear to complain. I need a listening ear to gripe. Now, now by the way, if this doesn't apply to you, you just tune me out right here. But, but I often find this is how it begins to arise in me. And I'll need a sounding board. Listen, I fight all these things just like y'all do. It's not just y'all that, that fight them. And I have, to, I have to listen to the correction of the Holy Spirit in my life too. But the Lord says here that we're to show hospitality to one another without the grumbling. Dr. Robert Leitner says the importance of this kind of behavior call for is set forth right in this passage. Before their testimony for Christ, the Philippian church, before their testimony for Christ could ever be effective in the community where they lived, the Philippians needed to set some things straight in their own assembly. Same with us. Before our testimony could ever be effective in Wascom and Marshall and the Shreveport area, all of this, before it can ever be effective outside, it's got to be right inside. And that means we cut out the griping, the complaining. Now, Proverbs addresses this this way. And, he, and, and the writer of Proverbs puts this in the context of a marriage relationship, but I think you could broaden this out. Listen to what it says here. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. So now move, move out from that, because we're not just going to pick on wives here. That could apply to husbands as well. But in a church context, in a family context, in a business context, in a school context, wherever you find yourself, if you are a person who is constantly complaining, here's what you become. You become like dripping water. Drip, 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 drip. Trying to go to sleep at night, and you hear that bathroom faucet there. Drip, drip drip. And he says, this is what being quarrelsome is like. This is what griping is like. This is what complaining is like. And he says, that needs to be rooted out of you. Paul's word to young Timothy, 1 Timothy 2 and 8, he says this, I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. And so how do we shine like lights? First thing is we cut out the complaining and the disputing and all of that, and the quarreling. Secondly, this, we do the work holding firmly to the word of life. We do the work without the complaining, and then we do the work holding firmly to the word of life. Look what it says back in verse 16, holding fast to the word of life, so in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So he says, I'm gonna, as I'm looking at your life, I know I didn't labor in vain if you're getting this right. If you are having the right attitude, not complaining, and if you're holding fast, if you're doing the work, holding fast to the Word. Now, the Word is the Logos, and the Logos can be seen in the written Word, that's the Scriptures, or it can be seen in the living Word, that's Jesus. And there, there's, there's truth when we look at both of that. You have the written word, the scriptures in front of you that you need to be diving into continually, deep in the scriptures. And you have the living word, the logos, the Holy Spirit inside of you indwelling you. That's, that's what you have in you. So that's part of how you shine like lights is you realize the power that you have in the word. He says you hold on to the word. We have, and I'm not overstating this, we have the only word of life because we have Jesus. There's a lot of other pop psychology out there, you know, that, that in self-help books and all kinds of things out there, gurus that, that can try to help you and maybe helpful on a limited basis, but we have really the only word of life. That's it. Jesus is, Jesus is the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is exclusive in that by his own words, by his own testimony. So we have the only word of life because we have Jesus. 
Jesus was speaking to Simon Peter in John 6 and verse 68. And he asked him, are you going to leave me too? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That was Peter affirming that. You're, you're the word of life, Jesus. Over in Acts 5 and 20, when the disciples were in prison and then they were released, miraculously, the word to them from the Lord was this, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. We have the message. Now, now hear me on this. And, and think of the written word, the scriptures, and think of the living word, Jesus. Let me make a statement to you. The more you get the written word in you, and the more you yield to the living word inside of you, the more, and this ties right back to the first point that we just talked about, the more it will drive the grumbling out of you. It's hard to grumble and complain if the Word is in your heart and on your lips all the time. They, they can't coexist in the same space. The Word of life is in your heart and on your lips. There's no room for complaining. It drives the darkness away. And you shine like the light that you're designed spiritually to be. How do we work out our salvation with fear and trembling? We shine like lights. And we do the work without the grumbling and complaining, and we do the work holding firmly to the word of life. But finally, we do the work with a sacrificial attitude. And this is so important that Paul teaches them this because this is what he's going through. And this is ultimately what they are going to go through in their context, in their culture, in the first century. Look at verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. And he gives it a likewise here. So something that's happening to him is going to happen to them also. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So he says, you do the work with a sacrificial attitude. And I think this is the third key. So Paul says here, he's being poured out as a drink offering. And he says, this is your attitude as well. So we have a progression there. Paul says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. It's upon the altar of your faith. And he says, and I rejoice with you. And then he says, likewise, you rejoice with me. Why? It goes in the reverse order. Upon the sacrificial offering of my faith, upon Paul's faith, he said, you can rejoice in what I'm going through. You don't have to despair. You don't have to dismay that, that he was going to be martyred ultimately, that he was going to give his life for the gospel. He said, because you can rejoice and that I'm, I'm making a sacrifice as well. And he says, ultimately, you're going to make that same sacrifice. You're going to be the drink offering as well. And so everything that Paul's going through, he says, you can rejoice because you're going to go through it as well. And, and you think, that's not very encouraging. You know, I mean, just honestly, uh, you're telling me that you're going to go through suffering and I'm going to go through suffering too and we can all rejoice in it. That's right, because there's something that happens, something that is quickened inside of you when you get a hold of this concept to really worship the Lord, to really go deeper in the Lord, to really be the light that you're supposed to be in the world. You have to take up this attitude of sacrifice. Like Abraham, when God said, go sacrifice Isaac, your only son. Now, God knew in his foreknowledge, in his sovereignty, that he was going to provide the ram and the thicket, the substitute. And all of that was a beautiful picture looking forward to, the, to, to Christ on the cross. It was a type. It was looking forward. And there was a fulfillment in Christ. But as Abraham did that, there was a sacrifice that was there that showed that with everything he was, every fiber of his being, he said, I'm giving it all to the Lord. When we come to that place where we say, everything I am, Lord Jesus, is yours. I'm going to put it all on the altar. I want to be poured out as a drink offering in everything I am, everything I have, everything. My family, my life, my business, my desires, everything I have, it is yours. You're going to get that sacrificial attitude deep down. And let me tell you something, you're going to shine like a light in the world when everything is focused on Him. It, it's an empowering thought. It's an empowering concept. And listen, it manifests itself in sacrifice through serving and sacrifice through suffering. Over in Galatians 5.13, Paul speaks to them about how they're to serve one another. 
For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. So it's sacrifice through serving, but then he says, and we've already alluded to it from the passage here, it's sacrifice through suffering. You're going to suffer. It's going to happen to you. Um, you're going to be poured out as well. 1 Peter 1, which speaks so much of suffering, says this in verse 6 and 7. It says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. It's just going to happen. If you stand for Christ, this world is going to continually, because it's under the influence of the evil one, it's going to continually stand against you. And suffering is going to come. And this is the attitude you've got to have. Lord, my life is a sacrifice to you. I'll give it all. And if you want to pour me out, if you want to spend me however you want, I'm currency in your hand. You spend me however you want. Lord, I will be poured out as a drink offering to you. Now listen, there's something beautiful about being poured out like a drink offering. To be poured out as a drink offering on the coals of the altar, that would dissolve. It would dissipate on those hot coals, and it would disappear. And the only thing left would be the sweet aroma to the Lord. Now that's a beautiful picture of what our lives are like. If we will get to that place where we say, it's not about me, it's about you. That... Annie Armstrong video was so powerful. There's only one picture of her. I think Amy was right, probably because she didn't slow down. I mean, how do you slow down? If somebody wants to take a picture. I don't have time. I've got 18,000 letters to write this year. Divide that out by days. How many letters she was writing every day just to do that? I think her thought was, I'm going to be poured out as a drink offering uh, upon the sacrifice of the, of the work of the Lord. This is my life. This is what it's going to be. And she is a beautiful picture of shining in God's firmament, shining like a light, shining like a star. That's the picture of Annie Armstrong. And she was poured out upon the coals like a drink offering, and she just, there's no pictures of her. She just dissipated. She just kind of disappeared. And only the legacy of what God wanted to remain of her is there to do what? To ultimately point us not to her, but to him. And point others to Jesus. What an illustration of shining like a light. When I think about the Gideons standing there on, on, on the street, handing out testaments to kiddos as they're coming out of school, um, and praise the Lord as they're going in our schools and handing them out in the class. Rayanne, I'm sorry if I'm causing you trouble. I won't, even, I won't even look over there at you. Praise the Lord for that. Shining like lights. We have teachers. We have administrators. We have custodial staff. We have support people that are, that are shining like lights. We have kids that are shining like lights. This is what it's supposed to be. There's something interesting here. And again, it's all about, it's not about us. It's about glorifying the Lord. There's something interesting here that as I conclude, I, I want to just call your attention to back in verse 15. After he tells them, do all things without the grumbling or disputing or complaining, he says that, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of this crooked and twisted generation. Blameless, innocent, guiltless. You say, I don't feel that way. I don't act that way. But this is what God has called you. This is what he's declared you to be because he sees you not in your filthy rags, but he sees you in the imputed righteousness of Christ. So he looks down and he sees you as perfect in your position. 1 Corinthians 1.8 says this, Jesus who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude 24, now to him, Jesus, who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. See, he's declared you to be guiltless. He's declared you to be blameless. He's declared you to be perfect. And that's interesting because you look at your life and you go, well, I, but I'm not. I'm not. But, but listen, here's where we're going to bring this together. If you're going to walk like a shining light that God has designed you to, and you're going to put away the grumbling and the complaining, you're going to hold firmly to the word of life that's living inside of you, that's in the scriptures. You can hold firmly to that. You're going to live your life with a sacrificial attitude, and this is how you're going to do the work. Here's what's going to happen to you. What he has declared you to be, hang with me for just another minute, what he's declared you to be, guiltless 
blameless, righteous. He will take what you practically are. And as you begin to walk with Him in this way and shine like a light, He will move you to where more and more what you are practically looks more and more in alignment and like what He has declared you to be positionally. And that's a powerful thing. See, you're guiltless and you're blameless in Christ. But He wants you to practically change. That's His sanctifying work in you. He wants you to look more and more like Jesus every day. And you can. And I see it in you. And I see you doing the work. And I see you shining like lights in your context in Wascombe. I see you doing that. I see it by the service projects you do and the way you minister to others. I see it by the sweet spirit. But we can always, always, and I start with me, we can always be hitting this better than what we are and be yielding more to look more like what Jesus wants us to. I'm a work in progress, but I'm called to shine like a light. And you are too. And as your pastor, I say, well done, I commend you in this. But let's not ever stop yielding to the Lord and asking Him, Lord, help me a little bit more to work out my salvation with fear, with trembling, so that I can shine like the light in a very dark world. Because this is your design for me. Let me pray over you this morning. Bow your heads with me, if you will. Justice is going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, can I tell you the light of the world is here. His Spirit is in this place. His Holy Spirit. He wants to save you this morning. So this morning, would you come to Him? If this is your heart's desire and you want to know Jesus, He is the only way to be saved. He's the only way to have a relationship with God the Father, and He's the only way for you to have eternal life. To not be resigned to an eternity in hell, but to have an eternity in heaven with Him. To have abundant life here and now. He's the only way of salvation. He is salvation. And if this is your desire to know Him this morning, don't just repeat these words, please. This is not a, it's just something to say. This is not just going through something legalistically. If this is your desire, speak these words to the Lord. Just tell Him right now from your heart, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Oh, forgive me, Lord Jesus. Jesus, thank You for dying on the cross to pay for my sin. I turn from trusting myself and I want to trust You, Jesus. Just tell Him that. I turn from trusting myself and I want to trust You, Jesus. Jesus, would you save me? Would you save me, Jesus, and be the Lord of my life? Ask him. Your words don't have to be perfect. He'll hear your heart's cry. If you prayed that this morning, let's thank him right now because his word is, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank him. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. You maybe were saved 50 years ago, and you can, you can thank him every day. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. If you got saved this morning, thank him. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Here in a moment, I want you to come and tell me if you prayed that prayer. Come and just share, and we'll, we'll help you with your next steps with the Lord. Be bold with it. You may be here, and you need to join with this church. The Lord's put that on your heart. Be bold with it. Come on. You may be here and you just need to come to this altar or take my hand and pray with me. Come on, be bold with it. Whatever it may be, the Lord's put on your heart this morning. We invite you to come. Father, thank you for the word that you've given us, how you speak to our hearts, the richness of it. Help us to go live this word out. As we walk from this place, help us to shine like lights in all the ways that you've talk to us this morning about it and we love you jesus and we'll give you all the praise and the honor and the glory in jesus name amen stand this morning if you will if you've got a decision to make or you've already made a decision we invite you to come right now come on as justice leads us